Hi guys, welcome back to Introduction to Kotlin. My name is Tensor. Today we're going to be looking at some of the more advanced types of classes, as well as some of the advanced features of classes. And we'll also take a look at nullables in Kotlin. If you've worked with Android or if you've worked with Java, then you'll have come across the null pointer exception errors in your application. These happen whenever you try to call a method or read a property of an object reference which is null. Kotlin is a null safe language. This means that for the most part we can avoid these types of errors. So variables in Kotlin cannot have a null value unless you explicitly declare their type to be nullable. In other words, by default types cannot be null. We've created a string called name and we've set it equal to null and you'll see that this gives us an error. To make this actually work out and not have an error, we just put a question mark after the type annotation. And this means that it can either be a string or a null type. This question mark can be inserted after any type name and it allows us to explicitly instruct the compiler that the value of the type can either store whatever we're referencing or a null. Therefore, it is nullable. Kotlin extends its null safety by making use of what's called a safe call operator. And you can see the use of the safe call operator here. We're printing out the name length. And if you just write name dot length for something that's nullable, you'll see that it gives you an error. So you've got to put this question mark before the method or the property call, whatever it is you're calling. We're explicitly instructing the compiler to invoke the property only if the value isn't null. And if the value is null, the compiler will use this string null as the value for us. If we call this as it is now, it'll just return null to the console. You can use this with methods and other things as well. If we run it, you'll see here that we get back null. We can also use a double exclamation mark operator to completely bypass this nullability checking. This is not recommended though because there's a high probability of getting a null pointer exception. And as expected, we do in fact get a null pointer exception while using this particular operator. We also have an alternative operator called the Elvis operator, which is this question mark with the colon after it. This allows us to basically say, okay, assign this value to n, and if it's null, then use this other value. So essentially it's allowing us to define a quote unquote default value for the variable that we're trying to assign. Also just note the reason why this is called the Elvis operator is because allegedly if you turn it on its side it looks like Elvis's head though I don't really see it myself. Kotlin also has various ways that we can deal with null inside of classes. Now imagine we have a property inside of our class A that references another class, say class B. And we don't use a constructor to set the property's value. So we set the value to null, and of course we have to use our null safety operator. And we also have this function that allows us to set the value of B after we've instantiated the object. An alternative and better way to write a property in this particular case is to set up the property as a late init property. If we use the late init keyword before we define our property, we don't actually have to explicitly define the property inside of the class. This late init modifier means that we've declared that this property is late initialized, meaning that the property will be initialized later. As long as we wait until the property has been given a value, we're safe to access the property's methods without doing any null checks. The property initialization can happen either in a setter method or through dependency injection. There are a few restrictions that are placed on using the late init keyword. The property must be mutable, so we must declare it with a var. The property cannot be a primitive type, so any of the number types, for instance. And the property cannot have a custom getter or setter. So as long as you keep those in mind, you can use these late init values to sort of use laziness to your advantage to avoid null pointers exceptions. If you remember, we talked about extension functions. We can also use this type Type of extension function syntax to create what's called an extension property. So here we're saying val string dot uppercase first letter, and then we're creating a getter for this, and this getter has what is essentially the function body inside of it. And this allows us to extend our properties in a way that's sort of like extending a class or an object. So you can see here that I've defined a property called name of type string, and I've put inside of it the word jack, and then I've called the dot to uppercase property on top of it. And this will automatically take the J and make it an uppercase letter. If we instantiate our person into P and then we print it out, we get back Jack with an uppercase J. So these are fairly useful and 
they cannot be accessed outside of the class. So even if I call p.name and then I try to call uppercase, you'll see that we, we don't have access to uppercase first letter outside of the class. Now let's look at data classes. So here we have a data class called person and inside of it we have five different properties. We have a variable property called fname, which is a string, a last name, which is a string, an age, which is an int, a height, which is an int, and a weight, which is also an int. We can take a look at the Java bytecode for this particular class, and you'll see how much boilerplate we've avoided by using this data class. This is the data class. It's a public final class person in which we've defined all of these different properties. And then all of these properties have their associated getters and setters attached to them. There's also a constructor that gets created, and there are various methods that are attached to this particular class as well. And you can see that it almost comes down to 171 lines of code. So this is the Java implementation of a data class, whereas this is the Kotlin implementation of a data class. And the only reason why this is taking up six lines of code is because I've deliberately spaced it out so that you can see it better. Data classes are essentially the equivalent to what are called POJOs or plain old Java objects in Kotlin. They're typically used to create the model for your data types. So they're sort of like structs or tuples in other languages. And we can use them to model the shape of our primary data types inside of our application. As we saw inside of the Java bytecode, there are various methods that are also attached to these particular data classes. We have the equals method, which allows us to compare two data objects. So this should return false because despite the fact that these are two person classes, they have various different data types inside of them. And here is our false. We also gain access to the hash code method. This returns an integer value that can be used for fast storage and retrieval of the data stored in hash-based collection data structures, for instance, hash maps or hash set collection types. And if we print this out, you'll see it's a rather large number and we can use it inside of, say, a hash map as a way to get are various different objects. We also have the toString method, which will give us a string representation of our object. And so this essentially is like allowing us to debug our object. We can see here that we have our person with a first name of John, a last name of Doe, age of 25, height of 152, and weight of 136. We also gain access to the copy method, which allows us to create a new instance of the object with all the same property values. So we can just call this by saying val p3 equals p.copy, and this will take our first p, take all the values inside of it, and then copy it into an object for p3. And for instance, say we just want to change like the last name, we could type in the last name value and then put in a new last name. Our value of P3 will be the same as our value for P with everything except for the last name. And you can do this for as many of the fields as you want. So because we're using a data class, we also have what are called component methods. These component methods allow us to gain access to each of the values inside of our data class. So if I call P.component1, this will access the first name p.component2 will access the last name. And you can see when I highlight component2, it highlights the last name. So these implicitly created properties do have a very useful purpose, despite the fact that they're a little awkward to use. And that is for destructuring our declarations. We can destructure one of our person data classes by simply calling val or ver and then writing in each of the variables that we want to destruct. So if we want to attach first name to first name, we put that in there. We can do the same for last name, for age, height, and width. And this is all because we have those component methods inside of our data class. You can also use an underscore in this case if you don't want one of the attributes. So say we only want to get first name, age, and width, then we can put an underscore for last name and for height. Kotlin also supports nested classes in a similar way to how we had nested functions. If we want to instantiate the inner class, we can just create a variable and set it equal to outer class dot nested class. A nested class in Kotlin is equivalent to a static nested class in Java by default. Also, nested classes do not store a reference to their outer class. We are also free to set our nested class as private, which means that we can only create an instance of the nested class with within the scope of our outer class. We also have access to a keyword called inner, which allows us to create an inner class. So this gives us a reference to our outer class from inside of our inner class. 
and you can see here that in this function enter we can call to our outer class by using this and a little tag attached to it. So I can instantiate our outer class by calling val outer equals this at outer class and then I can print out the outer property name and of course I can get and set it as I would with any other class. Kotlin also has what are called enum classes. The enum type declares a set of constants which are represented by identifiers. If we want to gain access to one of our enum values we can just call the class name and then the value name that we want. So in this case we're creating a variable called d which is set equal to our direction dot up. We can also gain the access to our direction up by calling enum value of and then we just have to pass a string representation of the value that we want to get. So in this case we want to get the direction up so we just pass in a string called up. We can also get all of the values if we want to by using the values method and conversely we also have the enum values function as well in which we can put in the type in sort of a generic way. Just like a normal class an enum type has its own constructor and we can give it properties which is associated with with each enum constant. We've created a property called code and so up has a code, down has a code, left has a code, right has a code, and none also has a code. If we want to gain access to this code value we can just instantiate the class and the value that we want and then just call that property on that instantiation. Okay, so now let's look at sealed classes in Kotlin. A sealed class in Kotlin is an abstract class in which you never intend to create objects from it. And we can use these sealed classes to extend other classes. The subclasses that you want to extend are defined inside the sealed class body or essentially in the same file. Because all of these subclasses are defined inside the sealed classes body, we can know all of the possible subclasses by simply viewing the file. So if we look at our example, we have a sealed class called animal and it is extending tiger, cat, and dog. And of course we know this is a sealed class by using the sealed modifier. Now just keep in mind that if I was to create a second file, we wouldn't be able to have access to the animal class to extend another class outside of this file. Sealed classes in Kotlin have various different rules. We can add the modifier abstract to a sealed class, but this is sort of redundant because the sealed classes are abstract by default. Sealed classes cannot have the open or final modifier. We are also free to declare data classes and objects as subclasses to the sealed class. And sealed classes are not allowed to have public constructors. Their constructors are private by default. Classes which extend the subclasses of a sealed class can be placed in either the same file or another file and the sealed class subclass that we want to extend has to be marked with the open modifier. So for instance say I want to extend the dog class with another class later I can use this open modifier and then I can create a wolf class and extend it with the dog class. Sealed classes and subclasses are fairly useful when we use a when block. We have a function called animal type which takes an animal type and then we have a when block which will then switch on that animal type. And if we have a tiger then we print out it's a tiger. If we have a cat we print out it's a cat and so on and so forth. We don't need to add an else clause because the compiler is smart enough to know that these are all of the cases that are covered with this particular sealed class. There's no generic animal class that we could just pass through here. Now for instance if we want to take off say dog and wolf we could then put in an else clause and then just say it is a dog or a wolf. Alright guys well I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did feel free to subscribe and like. If you have any questions or comments feel free to leave them in the box below and if you just liked it then downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.